Hello students, I am Dr. Sylvester Justin and uh, in today's medicine class, we are going to learn about disorders of the parathyroid gland. Let's get started with the topic straight away. The parathyroid glands, as you know, are four glands located at the back of the thyroid gland in the neck. We have two sets of them, the superior left and right parathyroid gland and the inferior left and right parathyroid gland. History. In endocrinology, the parathyroid glands and their diseases, they are one of the last to be defined. The gland itself was first discovered in the Indian rhinoceros in the year 1850. And later, it was identified in humans by Ivor Sandstrom. Also, McCallum and Carl Wotlin in 1908 suggested that removal of the parathyroid glands results in tetany due to hypocalcemia, thus elucidating its function in the body. Embryology, we are well aware that the superior parathyroid glands arise from the fourth pharyngeal pouch and the inferior parathyroid gland arise from the third pharyngeal pouch. But due to the descent of the inferior parathyroid gland much more than the superior parathyroid gland, it comes to occupy a lower layer. So that's your pharyngeal pouches and the more paradoxical, the superior arises from the fourth pouch and the inferior arises from the third pouch. Physiology. So we all know that the parathyroid glands are required for calcium and bone metabolism in the body. So, so the prime regulator of the parathormone is the calcium concentration in the blood. Whenever there is low concentration of calcium in the blood, as you can see in the diagram, there is release of parathyroid hormone from the gland and this causes efflux of calcium from the bone and decreases loss of calcium in the urine, also helps in production of vitamin D in the kidney. And finally, because of the action of vitamin D, it causes enhanced absorption of calcium from intestine. All these three effects lead to increase in the calcium concentration in the blood, thereby closing the feedback loop. Another major important hormone in the metabolism of calcium and bone is vitamin D. So we can juxtapose both the pathways and see vitamin D leads to is uh, formed in the skin by exposure of the skin to UV light and we get 7 dehydroergosterol and then it goes to liver and gets 25 hydroxylation from there and then it goes to kidney where it does 125 dehydroxylation so it becomes 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol or otherwise called as calciferol. Calciferol vitamin D active form it leads to increased absorption of calcium from the small intestine and decrease of excretion of calcium via the urine and also uh, parathormone we have already seen what it does so ultimate effect is that the serum calcium increases a third hormone and probably the last hormone here which is important in bone metabolism is calcitonin it is not secreted by the parathyroid but by the thyroid by the C cells. What is its function? Seemingly opposite to parathormone. It lowers the calcium levels in blood. It inhibits calcium absorption by the intestines. It promotes deposition of calcium into bones. That is, it inhibits osteoclasts and stimulates osteoblasts. And it inhibits calcium reabsorption 
in the kidney. So more of calcium is excreted in the urine. All of this leads to lowering of calcium concentration in the blood. So just the opposite of what thyroid hormone does. Histology wise, the parathyroid gland consists of chief cells and occipital cells. Chief cells are the ones which synthesize thyroid hormone. These cells are small and appear dark because they are loaded with parathyroid hormone. And when they secrete, they become clear. Occipital cells are larger and lighter in appearance, but their exact function is not known. So there we have the smaller, darker chief cells and the lighter, larger oxygen cells. Regulation of the parathermal secretion, as we know, it is all related to the calcium content in the blood. Normal parathermal gene transcription is suppressed continuously by normal levels of calcium in the blood. As soon as hypocalcemia occurs, exocytosis of stored parathermal occurs within seconds. Transcription of new mRNA occurs within hours if there is continued stimulation in the form of hypocalcemia. And when there is hypocalcemia occurring for a chronic time, parathyroid gland itself undergoes hypertrophy within days. That much sensitive and well-regulated is parathyroid hormone based on the calcium levels. <coughs> Regarding parathormone, it is produced inside the chief cells as a 115 amino acid sequence. It is called as pre pro parathormone. Here in the chief cells, it enters the Golgi apparatus and becomes 90 residue. Here it is called as pro parathormone. And finally, it enters the secretory granules by when it is further truncated to 84 amino acids only. This is the active form of parathermone. So the same steps, pre-pro parathermone, going to the Golgi apparatus, becoming pro-parathermone, and then going to the secretory vesicles, becoming parathermone, where they are stored for secretion into the blood. So, here it is again showing that the calcium, when it is decreased in the blood, it activates a receptor which causes all these functions, which causes the mRNA transcription and ultimately exocytosis of the parathermone. So, what is this receptor which is helping in all this regulation? It is the CASR calcium sensing receptor. It is a G protein coupled receptor. Stimulation of CASR by serum calcium leads to suppression of the parathormone secretion. It is also found in thyroid gland in the calcitonin secreting C cells of thyroid gland. Apart from this, it is also found in kidneys. In all the places, its function is to sense calcium and give feedback to the organ. So this is another diagrammatic representation of what we see. The calcium, as you can see at the bottom of the diagram, when it attaches to calcium sensing receptor, we see that it goes and gives a negative feedback to the DNA in the chief cell. So that parathormone transcription does not occur. But when calcium is less, this negative feedback is not able to happen, leads to transcription of parathormone mRNA, and then what happens? I have already said. How does the parathormone get metabolized? Initially by the liver hepatic and also by renal metabolism and clearance. So, in case of diseases of the kidney, we may expect a higher level of parathormone in blood. So Ultimately, what is the function of parathermal vitamin D and calcitonin in the blood? So, if we see, all of them have 
very different and unique functions. Parathormone increases calcium and decreases phosphorus. Vitamin D increases both calcium and phosphorus. Whereas calcitonin decreases both calcium and phosphorus in the blood. The interplay of these hormones is important for calcium homeostasis in the body. Now that we have learned about calcium and bone metabolism and parathormone, let us go into the disorders of parathyroid gland. First, let's look at hypoparathyroidism. So as you can see, most important causes of thyroid surgery where there is removal of parathyroid glands along with it. And also in case of parathyroid surgeries, also autoimmune diseases may destroy the parathyroid gland to also infiltrative diseases and then there can be some familial and genetic forms of hypoparathyroidism and finally in some cases we may not know what the cause is idiopathic being the cause what is the clinical manifestation of hypoparathyroidism most often it causes hypocalcemia which is manifested in the form of tetany phosphate sign trojo sign Parasthesias in fingertips and perioral region. And in the ECG, we may find prolonged QT interval. Again, let's look at some clinical features. Laryngospasm, tetany, feeding problems in the infant, muscle cramps, especially with exercise, seizures, parasthesias, numbness, and the three, swastik sign, trojo sign, and prolonged QTC interval. So we have a mnemonic called cats go numb, basically convulsions, arrhythmia, stephanie, spasms in stridor, and numbness in the fingers. Hypocalcemia, we have two important signs called trojo sign and swastik sign. Trojo sign is induction of carpopedal spasm by inflation of a stigma manometer above the systolic blood pressure of patient, about 20 millimeters above the systolic blood pressure for a period of three to five minutes. The response is that the adduction of the thumb, flexion of the metacarpal of the joints, extension of the intercalary joints, and flexion at wrist occurs in case of hypocalcemia. This is a very painful uh, maneuver for the patient. The patient has a lot of pain when we do elicit this trojo site. Swastik sign is another of it where we tap the facial nerve just in front of the ear, in front of the tragus cartilage. And in response to that, there is contraction of the ipsilateral facial muscles, twitching of the lip and spasm of all facial muscles. This is called swastik sign against again hypocalcemia. So, causes of hypocalcemia. So, as we said, from the beginning, thyroid gland and calcium are very, very closely, intimately linked. So if we talk about hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, we may as well talk about hypocalcemia. One of the main causes of hypocalcemia will be hypoparathyroidism and which we have seen so far. The other causes would be vitamin D related, that is deficiency or impaired action or end organ resistance for vitamin D. Apart from these, there can be some miscellaneous causes of hypocalcemia, including critical illness and pancreatitis, where calcium gets sequestered in the pancreas. There can be excess skeletal deposition in some malignancies. Also, immediately after parathyroidectomy, we encounter a condition called hungry bone syndrome, where the bone tries to get as much calcium as possible now that parathyroid hormone is not there. And this leads to hypocalcemia in the blood. Also, neonatal hypocalcemia is seen in premature babies, in asphyxia, in diabetic mothers, and in the mother had hyperparathyroidism. Also, some drugs like phoscarnate, citrated blood products, EGTA containing contrast agents, all these can cause hypocalcemia. 
we can have some clues about hypercalcemia based on the clinical condition. A person having acute illness like pancreatitis, it is self-explanatory. A person having autoimmune disease probably has destruction of a gland in the same autoimmune way. A person with family history of hypercalcemia probably has a genetic defect, perhaps in the calcium sensing receptor or in the parathyroid hormone secretion. We will be looking at a few of these later. Limited ultraviolet light exposure or poor dietary, poor dietary intake may suggest vitamin D deficiency as a cause for hypocalcemia. Similarly, neck surgery may think we may think of the removal of parathyroid gland, malabsorption syndrome. We may think is causing vitamin D deficiency and then hypercalcemia. And finally, renal disease. There may be secondary hyperparathyroidism and this will cause hypocalcemia. The reason for how hyperparathyroidism causes hypocalcemia we will be seeing, seeing in the topic of hyperparathyroidism. Yes, so now let's discuss about one rare genetic disorder which causes hypoparathyroidism. And here it's called as Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. It has a rare constellation of symptoms, including short stature, obesity, round face, and subcutaneous ossifications, that is, formation of bone under the skin and short fingers and toes, that is brachydactyly. Most important is that the fourth metacarpal, okay, the fourth metacarpal in the hand may be short particularly. So we may have normal fingers except that the ring finger might be smaller than the expected left. So when the disorder is inherited from the mother, features of AHO, that is Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy will be associated with resistance to parathyroid hormone. So even though parathyroid is excessive in the blood, there is hypocalcemia or clinically there is hypoparathyroidism, but if you check biochemically, parathyroid is even more than sufficient. So this false presentation of hypoparathyroidism is called as pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And when this happens, we can see that the patient is also having this orthopedic, this uh, bony problems in the body called Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. So, this is a child with this problem, has short stature, obesity, a round face. Okay. And then when we look at the hand, we see short stubby fingers and especially the ring finger, you can see is much shorter than what is expected. If you see the corresponding radiological image, there is shortening of the fourth metacarpal. This constellation of symptoms is called Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. Most of the times it is associated with resistance to parathormone, thus giving rise to hypoparathyroidism. But since when you check the blood, the parathyroid is even more than normal and it's the end organ resistance which is happening, we call it as pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Clinical features of hyperparathyroidism and biochemically not no hyperparathyroidism. It's actually more than normal. But in a rare, rare case, which we see here, when this disease is inherited from the mother, we get this. But when it's inherited, inherited from the father, we, gave the we give, get the same phenotype of Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. Person will be short, person will have the round face, and the person will be obese, will have brachydactyly, especially shortening of the fourth metacarpal. But when you check, the blood calcium level will be normal. The blood parathyroid hormone level will be normal. So phenotypically, we will get confused that it's Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. But if we check the blood, there's no hypocalcemia. So clinically, we would have thought this is a case of 
pseudo hypoparathyroidism but when you check the blood it is normal calcium so this condition is called as pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism because we have been fooled twice so the disease is due to mutation in the genus gene guanidine mutated alpha stimulating gene treatment of all hypocalcemia is by supplementing with calcium and vitamin d so uh, we have some types of pseudo hypoparathyroidism in which type 1a we have the constellation of symptoms for albright hereditary osteodystrophy a type 1b there is resistance to parathyroid hormone but without the osteodystrophy and then there is type 2 which is also like type 1b but can be separated based on some specific biochemical tests and then there is pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism where basically in essence parathyroid parathyroid hormone is normal but we get the phenotype the treatment of hypoparathyroidism parathyroidism as well as hypocalcemia is to give calcium if it's very low we may have to give iv calcium 10% of calcium gluconate 10 ml over 10 minutes a uh, so called rule of 10 and uh, if it is a chronic hypercalcemia we can give oral calcium 1 to 2 grams along with vitamin d3 and we can reduce the phosphate in the diet so we see parathyroid hormone is unique in two three ways Now one way is that it does not have a master control from pituitary gland like most of the other hormones which we learn in endocrinology most of them have different levels of regulation uh based on pituitary gland and hypothalamus but parathyroid responds and reacts only to calcium concentration in the blood second is in other hormone deficiencies we try to give the same hormone which is deficient but in hypoparathyroidism we try to treat it not with parathyroid but with calcium and vitamin d one reason of course was that we were not having the hormone for a long time now we have periparathyroid which is a recombinant fragment of parathyroid only the first 34 amino acids and it has almost the same effect as parathyroid and now we have the whole parathyroid also but it's just coming up now that we have understood about hypoparathyroidism hypocalcemia and resistance of resistance to parathyroid causing pseudo hypoparathyroidism let's go to the other spectrum that is hyperparathyroidism and the subsequent topic of hypercalcemia so hyperparathyroidism can be of three types primary secondary and tertiary we have already said there is no master control of parathyroid via pituitary or hypothalamus so what do we mean by primary secondary and tertiary primary as in all the other glands the fault lies with the gland which produces the hormone so primary hyperparathyroidism is where the parathyroid gland is secreting more hormone than necessary why will it do so whenever there is an adenoma or there is hyperplasia adenoma mostly affects one of the four parathyroid gland it is rare that more than one may be affected and hyperplasia can be general or may involve one or two or three glands also secondary hyperparathyroidism is where there is chronic hypocalcemia leading to hyperparathyroidism in the by way of parathyroid gland hypertrophy we saw in the very beginning that 
initial response to hypercalcemia is exocytosis of stored hormone. Next is mRNA production, which also takes place within a few hours itself. But if there is continued hypocalcemia, as seen in vitamin D deficiency, chronic kidney disease, malabsorption, vitamin D resistant rickets, malnutrition, intestinal disease, medications affecting vitamin D metabolism. In all these cases, there will be chronic hypocalcemia, as a result of which the parasitic gland undergoes generalized hypertrophy, all four of them, and leads to secretion of more parathormone. But the reason for secretion is hypocalcemia. So what you get in blood is more parathormone at the same time reduced calcium. So mostly it is secondary to vitamin D deficiency, chronic kidney disease, malabsorption, or some medication. So that's why it's called secondary. And that's the reason why in spite of parathormone being high, the calcium is low. Then what is tertiary? I mean, we don't have a master gland and now we have up to tertiary. Okay. So this is when in case of chronic renal disease, there is secondary hyperparathyroidism. Because of the chronic duration of hypocalcemia, there is chronic stimulation of the parathyroid gland. And because of this chronic hypertrophy, ultimately one of the glands becomes adenomatous or even carcinomatous. That is tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Also, it can be possible that all four glands may become too much hypertrophy, such that even if you bring normal calcemia by vitamin D supplementation and calcium supplementation, because of this continued chronic stimulus, the parathyroid gland is not able to come back to normal level and ends up secreting more and more parathyroid. In this case, we may have to go for surgery, even though it's not a case of clear cut parathyroid adenoma or carcinoma. So basically, the glands have stopped responding to the normal calcium levels. So again, the classification from another angle, primary is due to adenoma, carcinoma, or hypoplasia of the parathyroid. Secondary is in response to hypocalcemia. And tertiary is long-term physiological stimulation as in chronic renal failure. And the parathyroid gland loses control and does not respond to serum calcium levels any longer. Treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism. There is no effective medical therapy. What we advise is high fluid intake and avoid high calcium or vitamin D intake and the exercise is encouraged. And we can also give calcium sensing receptor blockers like sinacalcet so that it decreases production of parathyroid. So actually it is not the receptor blocker, but it is a receptor agonist. So when it goes and stimulates calcium sensing is graph CSR for much longer duration than normal calcium, it causes the MR production to decrease. So this is an algorithm in case of hyperparathyroidism. We diagnose it based on serum calcium and serum pro parathormone. And if both are increased, it is primary. If parathormone is increased, but calcium is low, it is secondary. And tertiary is when serum calcium is normal after years of stimulation also, parathormone is remains high. So the decision for or against sur surgery, that is removal of the parathyroid gland, is based on the CM vitamin D levels, the bone densitometry, that is the DEXA scan, whole energy X ray absorptiometry, and urinary calcium excretion and creatinine flows. So, surgically, how do we remove? We have to first localize the parathyroid gland. You can do an ultrasound and you can do technetium 99 metastatic cystamibi imaging. The advantage is 
you can also find ectopic locations of the parathyroid glands and go for them. Sometimes it might be higher up in the neck, sometimes it can be as low as the mediastinum also. Also, intraoperatively, we can measure the parathormone levels in the blood. And when we see a very significant drop, we know that we have removed the correct parathyroid gland. That way, we can avoid unnecessary removal of all four glands, which will ultimately enemies lead to hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. Medical treatment will basically be aimed at treatment of hypercalcemia. So that brings us to the topic of hypercalcemia. So how do we proceed? As I said, I am repeating once again. Hypercalcium and parathyroid hormone are intimately linked. So parathormone increases, calcium increases. So let's look at the other causes of it hypercalcemia apart from parathormone. It will be malignancy, excessive overzealous intake of vitamin D and ectopic production of calcium. So a case of hypercalcemia, we always check the parathormone. If it is high, we know that's a case of primary hyperparathyroidism or it can also be familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. We do a 24-hour urinary calcium excretion to decide which is which. And if the parathormone is low, we can think of malignancy. Malignancy is able to cause hypercalcemia in two ways. One is by the direct way of metastasis. That can be bony metastasis, lysis of the bone, and hypercalcemia. And second is a very sophisticated way, sophisticated way, like a parent neoplastic syndrome, that is secretion of parathyroid hormone related protein, PTHRP. Many malignancies arises arising from many organs, which can secrete PTHRP, and this leads to a syndrome of hyper apparent hyperparathyroidism and hypercalcemia. Rarely, a person may be taking too much of vitamin D and that could cause hypercalcemia. Usually not seen unless a person is taking excess more than 40,000 units per day. So once again, hypercalcemia, we have divided it into parathyroid related. That is primary para hyperparathyroidism that it could be an adenoma or a part of multiple endocrine neoplasia. Or it can be induced by lithium therapy or familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. It can be malignancy related due to bony meds or because of expression of parathyroid hormone related protein. Also, hypercalcemia may be associated with renal failure in severe secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. It's a two-edged sword, the secondary hyperparathyroidism. Also, aluminum intoxication and milk alkali syndrome also, by way of renal failure, can cause hypercalcemia. Vitamin D-related, we have already discussed. Apart from this, thiazide diuretics and vitamin A intoxication can cause hypercalcemia because thiazides reduce the urinary excretion of calcium. This part can be used in the case of hypercalcemia. So symptoms of hypercalcemia, so while we have tetany as the main symptom in hypercalcemia, here we have symptoms of brain, that is confusion, lethargy, trauma, and we have symptoms of GI disturbances like constipation, nausea, anorexia, we have renal dysfunctions, obviously, because of hypercalciuria, we can have nephrolithiasis, which can ultimately cause renal failure. And we can also have musculoskeletal symptoms like muscle weakness and bone pain. 
So even calcium excess is not good for the muscles or the bone. It's not like it's going to contract better. It will cause further weakness only and it will cause bony pain. So these symptoms are typically known by a rhyme that is bones, stones, abdominal groans and psychic bones. So a person having bony pain, that is bones, a person having renal stones, that is stones, and a person has constipation, nausea, and especially peptic ulcer disease also. So that is abdominal groans, and the person will have confusion, lethargy, also depression in some cases. So that's called the psychic moans, M-O-A-N-S. So here we juxtapose the symptoms of hypo and hypercalcemia. We see muscle cramps comes in hypercalcemia, whereas muscle weakness comes in hypercalcemia. And both of them have CNS effects. So how do we proceed? The algorithm is that you diagnose hypercalcemia, and once you've diagnosed, you find out if it's due to parathormone or a malignancy. 90% of cases of ambulant patients with hypercalcemia will have primary hyperparathyroid. And 90% of bedridden patients of hypercalcemia will be having malignancy. So these are the two main things we have to rule out. And finally, in this primary hyperparathyroidism, we have to decide about surgery. If it's a malignancy, we have to try to treat the underlying malignancy. And once you've done parathyroidectomy, again, it goes to hypocalcemia initially, which we have already seen how to treat either IV in the initial stages, and if it's chronic, we can start oral treatment also. We also have to be wary of the hungry bone syndrome, where the bone which has lost all its calcium in all these years, will try to get it back immediately leading to more and more hypocalcemia. This usually settles after three, four days of IV and oral calcium correction. So therapies for severe hypercalcemia, it's not hypo, it is hyper, is you have to hydrate with normal saline and you may give loop diuretic to cause force to diuresis. You can give bisphosphonates like pamidronate and zolindronate gave denosumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against rank ligand. You can also give special therapies like calcitonin, oral phosphate, glucocorticoids, especially in case of bony metastasis. You can also go for dialysis, which removes calcium in a very straightforward way. And you can also give sinacalcet, which is a calcium sensitive receptor agonist, used in secondary hyperparathyroidism, where it stimulates the calcium sensitive receptor and causes negative inhibition and stops parathormone production. So these are therapies of, for severe hypercalcemia. So thank you for your patient listening. Uh, parathormone is a slightly different and slightly difficult topic, but if we persist in studying it, we will be able to understand it fully. Thank you once again.